Good evening, everybody. What a, what a treat it is to be here. A year ago, I found out I was coming here, and I was very excited, not just because of Monday, but also because I get to spend a weekend with you. In fact, I love doing long things because I get to give a lot of different presentations on a lot of different topics. You'll find out very quickly that I am a nerd, and I love the Bible, and I love Jesus, and I love challenging people. Um, my goal today is to give you the strangest lecture you've ever heard. If at the end you feel comfortable, then I failed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to challenge your understanding of reality and how much you trust this physical world. Why would I do that? Because it amplifies God. The more we understand about how tenuous our existence is, the more God will be magnified. Now, why the Achilles? Who is Achilles in Greek legend? He's a fantastic warrior. His mother made him pervious by dipping him in the river of death, and the river sticks, but she held him by the ankle when she dipped him, so he had a fatal flaw. He died when he got shot by an arrow in the heel, and he bled to death. Kind of an ignominious way for a famous warrior to die. I'm using that as a symbol to represent evolution, deep time, millions of years. They seem so strong. They seem, it seems like you can't fight this edifice of, of you know, anti-biblical science, but there are tremendous weaknesses in that science, and if we look at it carefully, we can see them. So strangely, when a person approaches science, we should be humbled It should scare us. There's a lot we do not know, and there's a lot we cannot know. And yet, what do we see when we watch TV or read a a magazine, or you see a bunch of very arrogant people claiming God doesn't exist? Why? Because science. And I say nonsense. That's not true. But we will get through that, hopefully, as I go through this. I'm going to try to impress upon you three big ideas. One, Science depends upon philosophy. The scientists do not want you to know that. But it is absolutely dependent upon philosophy. In fact, a lot of the philosophy goes back to Thomas Aquinas, the medieval scholar who finally got rid of Plato and his influence in theology. And all of a sudden, Aristotle starts coming in. Oh, these are Greek philosophers. Yes, Greek philosophy has a huge impact upon not only our Christian philosophy, but on science itself. Number two, there are more things we don't know than we do know. Probably half of what we think is true isn't. But we don't yet know what isn't. So as we go through, we reject ideas. And you people who have more gray hair or maybe a little less hair than me... um, You grew up being taught things that nobody believes today. A lot of things. Now, you younger people, you're never going to hear those things. You'd have to dig and you have to look and you have to to fight really hard to figure out what they were. I'm I'm a huge history buff. I love World War II history. I'm reading it all the time. I was reading um, lately a... um, a diary of a German soldier who was fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front. And he, he, several times he, he wrote the word P-T-O-M-A-I-N-E. Tomain. You ever hear of Tomain poisoning? You older people have. Tomain doesn't exist. It was an imaginary substance that people believed up through the 1950s and 60s that was toxic. No, there's no thing that told me it's a bacteria that kill you, not a poison that meat just exudes as it's decaying. But it's an old idea that's been flushed. We got rid of it. It wasn't true. There's a lot more, and you're going to hear some of that tonight. I'm going to conclude, after all we do, that it is reasonable to trust the Bible. My goal is to help you solidify your faith in Scripture and your faith in Christ. But I'm going to rip the rug out from underneath you as far as what you think reality is composed of. You okay with that? Okay. I want you to think of something. Think of anything. Something you think is true. Your birthday. Your mother's birthday. What you had for breakfast. Think of something. And I'm going to ask you the question. How do you know that thing is true? 
Oh, well, you were awake at breakfast, right? You remember what you had for breakfast. How do you know you weren't dreaming? How do you know you weren't hypnotized and someone put a false memory in your mind? How do you know what your birthday is? You don't remember it. Your mother may have told you her birthday. How do you know she got it right? How do you know she wasn't lying to you? How do you know anything? Well, you use your senses, right? Like, there's something here. Even if I close my eyes, I know there's something here. My eyes are shut. I don't necessarily know what it is but I know there's something there. So we use our senses. We use our brains. We take in information. We filter the information, and we try to make sense of what we're detecting. You're okay with that, right? The problem is, as all of you students know, that learning is like drinking from a fire hose. Have you ever had biology class? Do you remember all the words you had to learn in biology? I don't, and I study this for a living. I forget them all the time. If I don't constantly refresh myself, the words fall. Just like, how much Bible do you think you know? How much Bible have you forgotten? If you don't constantly stay in the Word, your brain forgets it. And yet, when you're taking a Bible class or any class, the teacher's going, boom, 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 and this thing, ah. And so what do you do? You take a bunch of notes, like I see some of you taking, and then the morning or the night before your test, you study, 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 you go to the test, you go bleh, and then you forget it all. (laughs) You think you know stuff, and yet you forget everything. I'm not saying you, me too. That's how the human brain works. Here's the problem, though. Some of the stuff that you're learning isn't true. It might be the teacher doesn't know it. It might be the humanity doesn't know it, or it might be the person's lying. And if you go online, you'll be fed a steady dose of misinformation. Hence, people believe the earth is flat. If you do believe that, well, we're going to have a conversation later. Hence, people believe Bigfoot exists. No, Bigfoot does not exist. I'm not going to defend that. I'm just going to make a statement. Look, I might have said something that's wrong. What if someone finds a Bigfoot someday? Am I wrong? You don't know, do you? (laughs) Now, I said it that way on purpose because there's a lot of people who speak very confidently and they're speaking nonsense. Sometimes they do know it and sometimes they don't know it, but it's nonsense nonetheless. And it's everywhere in our society and the society is only getting worse. I had a conversation with the nice lady at the checkout counter at Delta at the airport. She looked at where I'm going. She goes, oh, you're going to see the eclipse? I said, yeah. She goes, well, what do you think about that? And I said, oh, she's thinking conspiracy theory. I said, well, I, I think that the moon is going to get between us and the sun and cast a big shadow on the ground. <laughs> and, and then we, the, we, the, we talked for like 10 minutes. It was a strange. And people were piling up behind me, but she kept on asking me questions. She goes, I, I heard in Jamaica there's no moon. I said, no, there's definitely a, a moon in Jamaica. Um, I, I've been all over the Caribbean. I'm, I'm you know, a coral reef ecologist. I've been all over the Caribbean. There's definitely a moon. Oh, well, maybe, maybe you just can't see it from Jamaica. No, no, you can see the moon from Jamaica. That's the level of crazy that we are, we're experiencing. And the world is getting weird and silly because there's people speaking things that aren't true. And the flat earth people, they're lying through their teeth on purpose just because they want to trick as many people as they can. The evolutionists are lying through their teeth even though they probably know what they're saying isn't true because they want, just like uh, Jesus about the Pharisees, you, you scour the earth to find this person and make him ten times the child of hell that you are. Sorry, I mangled that verse, but yeah, that's what they're doing. Anyway, here's the other, another, another problem. You haven't studied the same things as me. And this is my time. I get to talk about what I want to talk about. You don't have the knowledge or the authority to challenge much of what I'm going to present to you this weekend. That is true anytime you hear a lecture by anyone. Because a lecturer is supposed to know what they're talking about. So how do we challenge people? If they're saying something wrong, I mean, could you walk up to like the world's greatest scientist and say, Mr. Scientist, you're wrong about evolution, here's why. Could you do that? Probably not. 
you probably couldn't hold a candle to his knowledge. And so we're in an awkward position, aren't we? We want to believe Jesus. We want to believe the Bible. We want to believe what it says. And yet, there's some really smart people out there who are saying otherwise. And this is the worst thing of all. In our modern world, we've been divided up into little groups. If you go on the internet, the internet already knows who you are. If you Google something, you'll get different results than I will if I Google something. If you go on one of those social media platforms, they know who you are, they know what you like. They'll start suggesting things, friends and things like that, or, or videos or, or articles that they think you'll like. And when you click on it, okay, well, well and they, they, they put you in a little, in a little box and they spoon, spoon feed you information. And you know why they do that? Because if they gave you something you didn't like, you'll go find some, something else on a different website. They want to keep you there. So they make you happy by reinforcing the things you already know. That means that people aren't being challenged anymore with contrary information. That means they can walk around perfectly happy because they get all this confirmation of what they already believe. And hence, what happens in politics? Things divide. What happens in religion? Things divide. What's happening in our culture? We're more divided now than ever before. It's crazy how divided we are, and yet we have more information than we've ever had before. We should be able to like say, you know, this division is ridiculous. Here's our common, common points. But we see less and less of that. So I ask you again, how do you know what you know? Am I making you uncomfortable yet? 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now, of course, this is talking about the spiritual things. But we can't see the spiritual side of reality, can we? God sometimes comes down and visits us and gives us a little glimpse of something. Sometimes he reaches out and opens our eyes up to something. But most of the time in the Christian's life, we're walking around in a blind stupor holding on to something God might have shown us maybe 20, 20, 30 years ago, saying, yes, I believe that's true. But you have no empirical way to prove it. And we're asked to trust. And we're asked to have faith. But I see through a glass darkly. I don't see God. I don't see Jesus. And my sins get in the way. And my forgetfulness gets in the way. And it's so easy to live a nice, comfortable life here in America where we hardly even have to work anymore and forget God and forget his providence. The modern world is like a muffle on the spirit. It, 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 it's an oppressive presence that distracts us from God constantly. And yet I'm looking forward to that day when I can see Jesus face to face. Then I'll know. Right now, I can only trust. But that's true even for the secular scientists. They have to trust, and it makes them uncomfortable. New Scientist magazine put this on their cover several years ago. The question, why do we exist? Why do we grieve? Why are we irrational? Why is there a speed of light? Why does evolution happen? Well, that's an assumption, isn't it? Why are we conscious? These are the things that keep scientists awake at night. These are nightmare-inducing thoughts. Why? Because Mr. Smarty Pants or Mrs. Smarty Pants thinks they know everything. And all of a sudden, they're faced with the unanswerable questions. What if there really is a God? They don't go there. They can't think that. Because to say there might be a God means that their precious little science might not be what they think it is. I wrote an article in our Christian magazine. By the way, a couple of times this weekend, we're going to hand out a, a sign-up form for Creation magazine while I'm speaking. We're not going to do it tonight, though, because I'm going to see you multiple times. Um, but they're out there on the tables. If you like, you can sign up tonight if you like. Um, but this particular article is one of my favorite things I've ever written. I titled it, We Are Less Than Dust. I said, let's look inside the human mind and the human body. What are we made of? What, what's our basic component that we're made of. What's it called? 
Atoms? Okay, atoms. All right, all right. How big is an atom? It's really tiny, right? How far apart are the atoms from one another? And what's in between? Oh. What I did was I said, let's take, let's take an atom and make it as large as the sun. The nucleus of an atom, as large as the sun. Now we can compare an atom to a solar system. How far away are the electrons? Well, if the nucleus in an atom was as large as the sun, the first electron would be 13 times farther away than Pluto is from the sun. And if you're in a molecule, like you're made of molecules, right? Carbon, 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 maybe an oxygen or nitrogen in there. The two atoms in a molecule that share that electron, the second atom is over there somewhere. And electrons have no size. So these tiny little atoms, 26 times farther away from each other than Pluto is from the sun, and in between is nothing. You, in fact, okay, sorry, I just stuck this one in there this morning. Um, if you look at the sun, we're going to look at it on Monday. The sun is about your thumb's width in the sky. The sun is one half of a degree, or 30 arc seconds. From Pluto, the sun is only 0.75 arc seconds. It's less than one thirtieth the size in the sky on Pluto than it is from Earth. If you went twice as far as Pluto, the sun would be a pinpoint of light. That's how far, it would look like a star. That's how far away you would have to be. And in between these two pinpoints of light, there's nothing. So in the end, I calculate this, you are 99.9999999% empty space. How does it make you feel? This. There's nothing here. This is emptiness. And yet it feels so solid, doesn't it? Why, why do I feel it? Why do you see me if I'm empty? Why can I see you? Well, our little teeny atoms that are so far apart with nothing in between, they have these electrons, this electronic force field. And the photons from these lights, by the way, we don't even know what a photon is. We don't know how lights work. We don't know how electricity works. We don't know how gravity works. We use it all the time. We don't know what they are. These photons, these... Getting excited here. <laughs> these mysterious particles or waves or whatever they are coming out of these lights, they come at the speed of light from that thing. They hit my electronic force field and they bounce off this electronic force field and that's why you can see me. I am a hologram. And so are you. If you stripped away your electrons and you look at all the little nu nuclei and you packed them together, you wouldn't be able to see yourself. You could take all of the atoms in the entire universe, take away the electrons, just pack all the neutrons together. You have to overcome the, the, the repulsive force, but if you could do that and hold all those nuclei together, the entire universe would fit inside our solar system. All the billions upon billions of galaxies are also empty. Genesis 3, 19, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's fun, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. What is evolution? If you had to define evolution, what would you say? Everything started with the Big Bang. Okay, oh, look at that. Yes, you, com you combined the origin of life and evolution of life with the origin of the universe. No, that's fine. That's, that, that, this is what people always do, and that's what the evolutionists always do. Because they can't have... No, sorry, it's just a long story. They always mix these things together. Like when I ask people, um, someone asked me about carbon dating. They do this all the time. You know what I say in return? Oh, carbon dating. Do you mean uranium to lead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, that's not carbon. What? And I have an opportunity to say, no, carbon dating shows that the earth is young. Thank you, Mr. Evolutionist, for inventing carbon dating. But now that you can't find any carbon source that has zero carbon-14, science has shown that the Earth is not millions of years old, according to carbon dating. Anyway, evolution. 
if you go to any secular college, you're going to have to take a biology class or any, any science class, and the first page of every textbook is some tome to evolution. Blah, 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 evolution happened. And it's always the first page, and the rest of the book usually ignores it. But the first page is always about evolution, and they tend to define it as just change over time. And things, since we know things change over time, evolution must be true, right? The word means change over time. It, evolution means to unfold. That's what it, so you take that, it's the idea of change over time. However, that's not, I mean, I believe things change over time and I'm not an evolutionist. So that can't be the definition. Because what if the change is circular? What if it's downhill? They don't believe that. They believe that enough change over enough time can be used to explain the common ancestry of all things. Ah, if you don't have that phrase, common ancestry, in your definition of evolution, you're not defining what evolution means. Oh, common ancestry, deep time. See, here's how this works. Take the study of biology. I am a biologist. I study living things. Take the study of biology and add a philosophy to it. The philosophy of naturalism. And ism is a belief, right? Like Buddhism, there's no Christianity-ism, but okay. And ism is a belief. You apply the belief that nature is all there is. The belief that the laws of the universe have always been constant and nothing has ever interfered with it. So you cut God out from the equation and, and immediately. The idea that the present is the key to the past, that things always are, always have the way they are now, that nothing has ever changed. The belief that natural processes can explain everything that's ever happened in the whole history of the universe. That's a big assumption, isn't it? It's called naturalism. If you add naturalism to biology, you will get evolution. But I am not a naturalist. I am a theist. Theism is a belief in God. If you add the philosophy of theism to biology, you'll get some form of creation. You might get evolutionary creation. You might get punctuated creation. You might get, you get all sorts of various phrases. Now, if you want to put me in a box and say, what are you, Carter? I'm going to say, I'm going to, you might call me a young earth creationist or even a young age creationist because it's also the universe that's young, not just the earth. You might call me a biblical creationist, but then what exactly is, because even the Old age creationists claim to be biblical. So, but if you want to put me in a box, I'm going to say the earth is not millions of years old. Now, how old is it? Great question. It's a little more than 6,000 years old according to Scripture. The way I understand it. Now, I, didn't, I can't put a specific date on it because the purpose of the Bible is not to give us a history of everything that's ever happened in the history of the universe. The purpose of the Bible is to point us to Jesus Christ. The biblical story is a story of God seeking out a bride for his son. It's not a history book necessarily, though it does talk about a lot of history that has to be true. It's definitely not a science book. I mean, how much taxonomy can you learn from the Bible? Oh, God creating flying things and swimming things. That doesn't tell us a lot about taxonomy, does it? Because it's not the purpose of Scripture. And yet, I was trained in a very specific philosophy. All my secular training at, at Georgia Tech and the University of Miami, there was a philosophy behind it. Anyone want to take a guess what that philosophy was? It's right there. It's a philosophy of naturalism. And because everything is couched in naturalistic terms, students are never challenged on any of the things I've been talking to you about. And since they're never challenged on it, these topics don't even come up. And the people who might be thinking such thoughts usually don't go into science, or they're cut out from the pack and, and gotten rid of, or they just train themselves to never say anything. And what happens? Faith withers and dies. Ah, huh, but... Consider this, not this television. See that molecule right there? That's one of the letters in your DNA. There's a piece of DNA. You have six feet of DNA inside every one of your little microscopic cells. Well, let's turn this DNA into a protein, shall we? We need a machine right there. 
That is called a polymerase. Now, we're way oversimplifying this. But we have the letters floating in from one end, and the polymerase matches them up to corresponding letters on one strand of the DNA only. It opens the strand up. There's like 50 other proteins involved. We're only showing a little bit. And then that red strand is called RNA. The only difference is instead of a T, there's a U. Very similar chemically, but that RNA now holds the code for a protein. Now, usually these are heavily modified by the cell using thousands of other processes. Skip all that. We're going to use these things. These are called transfer RNAs. At the bottom of the transfer RNA, there's a three-letter code that's going to match up to three letters in the RNA inside this machine. This is called a ribosome. It's a combination of RNAs and proteins. That ribosome will literally, three letters at a time, match these things up. But on the top of the transfer RNA, there's an amino acid. The amino acids are building blocks of proteins. And so here we're manufacturing a protein. But most proteins that are left to themselves will make a, a, a bird's nest. They need help folding. So these other proteins called chaperones come along. They grab onto the protein to prevent it from folding. And they will chaperone it to another molecule called a chaperonin. By the way, um, this is Nobel Prize material here. Millions of dollars of research and PhDs were granted on every single step I'm showing you. But this chaperonin molecule, we don't even know quite how it works, but it's made of multiple proteins and it's sort of shaped like a barrel. And the unfolded protein goes in one end and it closes up and it gets folded. And if it folds incorrectly, it'll chop it up and recycle the pieces. And out the other end pops a three-dimensional structure. We went from a line, a one-dimensional molecule called DNA. In that DNA, there's an alphabet, there's a language. Three letters makes one word in that language. Thousands of three-letter combinations in a row was first made into RNA, which is a parallel language, a little different, and then that was translated into a radically different language. The chemistry of that protein has nothing to do with the A, C, G, and T in the DNA. How does a cell know how to make a protein? In fact, this, um, this protein operates in four dimensions. Not only does it have a three-dimensional shape, most proteins change shape over time, the fourth dimension. So we went from a one-dimensional linear language to a four-dimensional language. That's crazy. But that protein we just made there, that might be one of the proteins that's used to take the DNA and turn it into RNA. That might be one of the proteins used to translate it. That might be one of the proteins used in the ribosome. You can't get DNA to make a protein before the proteins are there to make the DNA into a protein. So what came first? There are massive chicken and egg problems everywhere in biology. The evolutionists know this. They don't want you to know it. The way life works is this. God makes life. He fills it with the chemicals. He fills it with the proteins and the nuclei and the, the fats and the sugars and the cell membranes. He puts energy in it, gets all ready, and he lets go. And now we have life. Life is never going to arise by itself. And the more we study biology, the more complicated life becomes and the more ridiculous evolution becomes. But they don't want you to think that. They want you to think the problem is easy to solve. Psalm 92.4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How many of you sang for joy in the middle of biology class? <laughs> now, you're probably like, I can't believe I have to learn another hundred words just from one day. I can't keep up. Is that what you thought? Yeah, well... Leave it to God to have a name for everything. Not that God named. We're naming the things that God made. How's that? Leave it to God to leave us having to invent thousands of names for things that he made. And it should bring us joy. Even when we fail a test. What does that mean? That means the material is really hard. And God is amazing. And I'm stupid. And it's Okay. 
It's okay to not know everything that God knows. It only amplifies God and humbles us. Hey, did you know that science was invented by Christianity? Did you know that? Science did not come to us from ancient Greece. You could not do science in Greece. Why? Because what if there really was a Zeus? And what if he didn't like you? And you set up an experiment with some lab rats and a cancer treatment, and you come in the morning, half your rats are dead. Well, was the chemical you gave him from the cancer treatment, or does Zeus not like you and he sent a lightning bolt down and killed half your lab rats? You cannot do science in that environment. You couldn't have done science in ancient Ireland or ancient Germany, because what if there really are pixies in the garden? And they're mischievous. And they sneak through the window at night and rearrange your test tubes in your rack. If you can't trust the universe, you can't do science. If the universe experiments back on you, you can't do science. We need a trustable universe, a steady universe, a universe that operates according to law. Being that God is the creator God, and being that God never does anything against his own nature, that God of the Bible, when he created the universe by his own nature, he would have created a universe that operates according to law. That, my friends, is where the idea came from that led to all of our modern technology. It came from Christian philosophy. It's just a straightforward reading of the Bible tells us the universe is trustable because my God is trustable. The the force of gravity, the speed of light, the magnetic attraction between things, that's not going to change because it's not in God's nature for such things to change. In the evolutionary world, there's no reason for the speed of light to always be the same. It just is. So therefore, we have no reason to doubt it. Yeah, but you have no reason to believe it either. We have a better starting point. Our fixed point is God. Therefore, science works. I bet you've never heard that before. The historians and the scientists don't want you to know this. But what happened? Eh, 100, 200 years after modern science's birth, we have something called the Enlightenment. And this is when the philosophers got involved. And they got rid of God and kept the laws. And we've been fighting this battle now for three or 400 years. The battle is not over the boiling point of water. The battle is over views of philosophy. Okay? So I'm going to give you a truth. Ready? The universe was created. Another truth. The universe is naturalistic. Now, I hate that word nature. I shouldn't use the word hate. I I dislike that word nature because that's a Roman goddess. But we don't have another way of English to say things happen according to the laws of probability and statistics all by themselves without any outside interference. (laughs) Instead, we just say it's natural. Okay, as long as we understand what that means, I'm not actually invoking the name of of an imaginary goddess. The universe behaves naturalistically. Naturalism is a wonderful science for the laboratory. When I run an experiment, I expect it to happen according to the laws of probability and statistics. And I don't have my finger on the scale. I'm going to let it happen by itself. And I should be able to repeat again and again and again and again. That's naturalism. But naturalism is terrible at explaining origins. So they had a good run of it. For a couple of hundred years, they said, wow, naturalism works. And they kept going and going and going and going. And what happened? The second half of last century happened. Our understanding of the complexity of life went whoo. And naturalism's power to explain it went whoo. And they don't want you to know that. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe is created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Wow, that almost sounds like he's advocating contrary to naturalism. Naturalism says that the physical forces and the, the objects we see can explain where everything came from. No, we understand the universe is created by the word of God. Or else we have to hold ridiculous propositions like life formed by itself. 
Yeah, life doesn't exist without the information coded into DNA that we can transcribe into RNA and then translated into proteins that had to form spontaneously all by itself? No. Everybody do this. <sighs> Listening to someone like me is hard, isn't it? I'm, I'm coming at you fast and hard. I'm not trying to get you to turn your brain off or get tired of listening. I'm really trying to challenge you. Do you feel challenged? All right, let's, let's take another approach to science here. What is science? Let's say that science is just a way of thinking. It's a, a way of approaching the universe. It's an interpretive filter of reality. So we learn a bunch of things, we, we, we filter them out, and we try to sort them and organize them and put them into our nice little scientific thinking. Well, let's, what if reality is these vertical red lines? And what if science is these gray lines? Can you see that if, if your thinking is wonky, you're still going to get some things right? Just because evolution is wrong doesn't mean evolution is wrong about everything. And so what the evolutionists do, they only talk about the things that they get right. And they avoid the big questions. And they avoid the contradictions. And by saying, hey, this is a fact, this is a fact, this is a fact, this is a fact, and this is a fact. All those things are true, and all those things match evolution. That is a powerful way to convince someone that evolution is true. When you never present them anything that actually challenges the theory. Now, I'm not claiming that my way of thinking is perfectly aligned to reality. That would be hubris. Um, it's, it's definitely not true. I am really ridiculous in some of my thinking, things I don't understand, things I don't understand correctly. We're all in that position. However, can you see that the closer your thinking gets to reality, the more you'll understand about that reality? And I'm going to tell you that if we align ourselves to the God of the Bible, we'll have a better grasp on reality than if we don't. Okay? So what's natural selection? You've heard that before. What is it? Well, it's not magic. Again, right? Nature doesn't exist. The goddess is not there. Nature is not doing any selecting. Nature is not alive. And when an evolutionist says natural selection, they don't mean the universe is doing any selecting. But that's a pretty bad phrase. So Herbert Spencer, a good friend of Charles Darwin, he came up with the phrase survival of the fittest. But that's also an ugly phrase because who's the most fit? Is it the strongest, the fastest, the one with the best eyesight, the smartest? No, 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 and no. By definition, in evolutionary science, the most fit is the organism who has the most offspring. It's about reproduction. Now, Darwin, all his examples, he used life and death all the time. But no, it's about reproduction. Um, even the, 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 the Nazi regime in Germany understood this. They didn't just kill off all the Jews and homosexuals and the gypsies. They wanted to fight a war to kill off the weak Germans. They wanted to purge themselves of the weak elements of their own race, even though it's not a race, so that they would be stronger at the end than they were at the beginning. That is very straightforward uh, Darwinist naturalism applied to a population. And it was absolutely wrong because Guess what units had the highest casualty rates in World War II in Germany? It was the SS. The cream of the crop, the smartest and the strongest, died in droves. Who survived the war? The guys that shirked military responsibility and hid in the baggage. The hulking studs died. The weenie guys, they got the girls afterwards. Maybe I have hope. Natural selection is only about reproduction. It's essentially the organism with the most offspring wins. But the phrase is differential reproduction, but that's also a terrible phrase. What is it? Well, I just explained what it means, but you're, differential reproduction. Some organisms are more suited to their environment than others. The ones that are more suited to their environment tend to have more children. I mean, my ancestors came from northern Europe. I've got 
northern Germany, southern Norway, northern Netherlands, Ireland, and England. So when it's like today, kind of drizzly, cold rain, I'm like, yes, ancestral weather. Oh. Um, I lived in Miami for nine years. I was miserable. It's so hot. I mean, I run my air conditioning in January. It was just so hot. Um, I was failing in that environment. I like it cool. I don't know why. I'm just built that way. So I would have chosen to live in a cooler environment. If I was forced to live in a hot environment, I, I don't know, I just don't fare well. Now, it's nothing about me having babies or anything like that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it's, it's kind of like a, a no-brainer that the things are better fit will have more babies. It's not evolution. It's not anti-God. It's just common sense. Let me give you an example, though, of evolution, of natural selection. Here we have two bacteria, a normal one and a mutant one. The mutant has a tiny little pore, so the purple antibiotic can't get in, and the food can't get in, so it grows slowly. On the left, though, a normal pore, ooh, the purple antibiotic goes right in. The thing can eat all the food that he wants. Guess what happens when the antibiotic's a solution? Wait a minute. The normal one survived? I mean, the normal one died and the mutant survived? The one that grows slowly survived? Yeah. Almost every example of antibiotic resistance I can think of, something's broken. Either there's a detoxifying gene that's hardwired to be on all the time, which means the bacteria is spending a lot of time making that protein. So then when it hits the antibiotic, it can detoxify it. Or there's a broken pore, so things can't get in and it grows very slowly. Antibiotic resistant bacteria are not as fit as normal bacteria until you add antibiotics and the normal ones die. Uh, this is not onward and upward evolution here. Yeah, this is, if you would, change over time or natural selection, but it's going the wrong direction. This is why I say, I don't care about natural selection. I can, I can accept that. That's fine. It's just not what the evolutionist needs. Let me explain it this way. Imagine we have two worlds. We have the world of evolution and the world of creation. Is it true that every fact I find that supports evolution proves evolution to be true? That doesn't make any sense. Is it true that every fact I find that supports creation proves creation? No, no one's saying yes, but you don't quite get at what I mean. You can't use the word proof in science. You can't prove anything. You can't prove you're awake. You can't prove I'm not a robot. You can't prove that. You have to make giant philosophical assumptions to even approach science. But here's what's worse, though. Creation and evolution are arguing over the same set of facts. They both claim a lot of the same things at the same time, which is why I don't have a problem with natural selection. What you have to do is you have to get outside that area of overlap to show if a, a theory is true or false. You have to go to a place where the theory can't explain things, which is why I keep talking about the origin of life and complexity. Those are the things that the evolutionists don't want to talk about because they know it's their Achilles heel. But by giving students a bunch of things that do support the theory in that area of overlap, and by ignoring the uncomfortable places in evolution, evolution looks like a very strong theory. And that, my friends, is the secret. If you can see that, you're going to be bulletproof. But you have to train yourself to see it. And I will tell you that sometimes it is overwhelming and it's daunting and it's scary. All right, one more little illustration for you. I want you to think of the smallest thing that you can see. There's a speck of dust floating in the, in, the, in the light. Now think of the biggest thing that you can see that you know how big it is. You don't know how big the sun is. In fact, we didn't even know until the 1700s how big the sun is. We had to use triangulation, and it's a big, complicated process. But you know how big you are. I bet you know how big your house is, depending on how long you've lived there. You've, you've probably been to every little nook and cranny. You've been all around the outside. Maybe you've been up on the roof, down in the basement. You've got a pretty good sense of how big your house is. I bet you could probably walk around your house, put some shin guards on, with a blindfold, 
and get around your house. Do you know how big your neighborhood is? Probably not. So you're limited in what you can know, and it's only based on experience. All right, what's the shortest time interval you can experience? Blink of an eye, right? Snap of a finger. What's the longest time interval you can experience? Well, maybe when you were born, dad planted an apple tree in your front yard. And your whole life you've been living in the same house and you've been watching this apple tree grow. That's all you can know. You weren't around before the apple tree. You're, again, you're limited in the, how fast you can see things and how long a uh, time interval you can experience. Now, we have po- pulled all of human history together, and we have a timeline that goes back a few thousand years. And that's it. There's no written history before that. And we've invented telescopes and microscopes and atomic clocks and things. So we have increased from our zone of observation to our zone of instrumentation. But these aren't things we're arguing about. The evolution creation debate is outside of that. It's in the things we can't know. It's in the places where faith comes in. All right, one more illustration for you. I love these little illustrations, by the way, so I'm just throwing a bunch at you. Isaiah 46.10. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. How can God know the end from the beginning? You can't. You don't know what's going to happen in the next second, let alone things far in the future. How can God know all of time at the same time? Obviously, God's not trapped in time. Everything God created is in time. You get the question, who created God? No, you can't create God. An eternal being has no beginning. God was never created. In fact, God created time. When um, Jesus went across the the Sea of Galilee and he ran into that man on the other side who was cutting himself and no, no one could bind him, he runs up, falls at Jesus' feet. What have you to do with us? Have you come to torment us before our time? Even angels and demons are trapped in time. It's a linear time. You can't go backwards. Now, according to Einstein, you could speed it up or slow it down, but you can't go backwards. It's only inexorably going in one direction. How does God know the end from the beginning? Well, you've heard the phrase, the hour of, hour of time. You've heard that before, right? One direction. Oh, yeah, I got a pen. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to get, get out a pen here. This is the, I don't have an arrow. Of course, past the granola bars, past my computer mouse, my spare hard drive. There we go. There we go. Here's my hour of time. Now I'm looking at this. I can't see the whole thing at the same time. I have to look left and right to see the beginning or the end or the middle. If I go really far away, I still have to look left and right. How does God see the entire thing at once? God's a higher dimensional being. He's not trapped in our 3D, 4D universe. And by taking this fourth dimension time and turning it like that, all things collapse into a point. Time is simultaneous for God. This means that when God set up the universe, he knew what was going to happen. Sending Jesus Christ down to this earth was not plan B. He knew when he created the universe, when he said, let there be light, that Jesus Christ is going to be hanging on the cross to pay for your and my sins. He knew that. Now, I can't explain why he dallies. I can't explain why he created the universe knowing that sin was coming. But what conclusion can we draw? Psalm 139, 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Do you know it very well? I can guarantee you there's people, probably more than one in this room, that's severely wrestling with their faith right now. Do you really know it very well? I think I probably removed some objections in some people's minds. I hope so. That's been my prayer 
coming up to this. I hope I really did challenge many of you. But consider what evolution is doing. It's questioning something. Look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, what's a Word? I don't know yet. And the Word was with God. Okay, there's a Word that's with God. Oh, the Word was God. Okay, because the Word was God. We've got God, he's calling himself the Word, and I'm getting kind of Trinitarian here. It's all confusing. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through whom? Through the Word. And without him, the word, was not anything made that was made. Notice, of course, God has no, God's not made, right? So that excludes God there. And the word became flesh. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. Jesus Christ is a part of the Trinity that said, let there be light. The creator of the universe knew that he was going to be coming down here and hanging on a tree 2,000 years ago. That's amazing. I'm going to leave you with this. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, that's heaven or hell, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? My friends, we have no excuse. Science points us straight to God, and there's no other rational answer. Oh, there's so much more. I mentioned Creation Magazine before. Uh, we have it on the tables. Call, take a look at it. I, I think God kept me in Christianity because of Creation Magazine. Not a joke. A lot of the, video, the videos that you saw, a lot of illustrations, they came out of a book and a movie called Evolution's Achilles Heels. Powerful material out there on the tables also. If you like reading books, if you like watching things, if you still have a DVD player, I don't know. But you can also, um, on our website, you can get that streaming version. In fact, streaming. The first streaming thing we ever put up on our website were the historical atom, theological conundrums, and scientific implications. That is free still. You can go on our website and watch it. It's going to be very similar to, um, what am I doing my historical atom talk? This Saturday? I think it's tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, it's tomorrow. I don't remember which one tomorrow. But come to hear about Y chromosomes and DNA and Adam and the history of the world tomorrow. And I'll point you to our, our website. And now, it's 8.03. I kind of wanted to stop 15 minutes ago, but I was having too much fun. Um, <laughs> are you okay with 15 more minutes of questions? I don't want to go, I don't like questions that, the question times that peter out. We're going to do 15 minutes, stop. Who's got a watch? Okay, sir, you're my timekeeper. Okay, so at 8.15, 12 minutes from now, you do this. 